So uh, as I said earlier, what we're going to talk about primarily um, in this lecture is the sh issue of endosymbioses and the origin and evolution of the mitochondria and the chloroplasts across eukaryotes. So in a way, it's interaction between eukaryotes and uh, bacteria, as you will see. And in the next lecture, we're going to talk about really how you study microbes. And we're going to use as an example extremophiles, but we're sort of going to go back and forth between the way that we study microorganisms and also the biology of extremophiles. So what we're going to do today is try and address these three questions related to mitochondria and chloroplasts. What are they? That is really, as you will see, what is their evolutionary history? When did they get there? When did these organelles originate into the eukaryotic cell? And really try and understand a little bit about how they got there, or at least a model of their evolutionary sort of mechanism by which they were brought into cells. So we're going to start with this just what are they? And remember, um, how could you forget that there are many, many lineages of eukaryotes? Um, if we look across the diversity of eukaryotes, what we're basically going to do is ask which ones have mitochondria, which ones have chloroplasts. We're going to treat those organisms, that character, mitochondria or chloroplasts, uh, and look at the presence and absence of them as a character state and see if we can come up with just a simple explanation based upon tracing presence and absence of them across eukaryotes. So we're going to do that with um, mitochondria first. So first, um, we should consider looking at mitochondria. If you look at them in a microscope, this is, was only possible once people developed microscopes that could really look inside of cells. So when people first started to study various microorganisms, really you were looking at the major features of the cell and could not discern in a lot of detail about the intracellular structures. But if you look um, inside eukaryotic cells, many of them have an organelle like this, um, the mitochondrion. And as I assume you're familiar from BIS2A or from other courses, in many eukaryotes, the mitochondrion carries out energy metabolism, converting sugars into ATP for aerobic respiration. If you look at these mitochondria, they have many physical similarities to prokaryotes, to bacteria and archaea. They were first viewed before anybody knew what archaea were, so they sort of just said they were similar to prokaryotes. Um, and if you look inside of them, you can actually isolate many of the components of mitochondria. They have inside of them their own, for example, DNA, their own uh, transcription apparatus, or at least they transcribe the DNA into RNA. They translate the RNA into proteins. So in essence, it's like having a separate entity within a eukaryotic cell that's carrying out some of its own functions. If you look in detail at those objects, the ribosomes, the transcription apparatus, etc., they resemble in many ways those that you would find in bacteria or archaea. But remember, phenotype, the appearance of things, can be misleading. We can have similarities that are due to common ancestry, and we can have similarities that are due to convergent evolution. So the real final sort of detail or the best way to resolve what mitochondria are is to take this DNA and to look at it in essence in the same way that Carl Woese looked at organisms to build a tree of life. You, you pull out the DNA from the mitochondrion, you extract the DNA, you can run a variety of chemical reactions. We're not going to go into a lot of details on this now, but one of them is this polymerase chain reaction or called PCR that can pull out specific genes of interest. You can pull out the ribosomal RNA genes from the mitochondrion. They have their own ribosomal RNA genes. You can read the string of letters, the sequence of them. 
You can build a data matrix to compare them to other organisms and then build an evolutionary tree of them. Now you have bacteria, archaea, and eukaryotes like Carl Woese did, and you've added onto that data set mitochondria. And you can see where they fit in an evolutionary tree compared to bacteria, archaea, and eukaryotes. When you do this, what people have found is that mitochondria trace their evolutionary ancestry to bacteria. They are embedded within the bacterial branch of the tree of life. Not only are they embedded within the bacterial branch, they are embedded within the proteobacteria, that it was one of the six major lineages of bacteria we talked about. We didn't, because I didn't want to drive you completely insane, but we didn't talk about the subgroups of the proteobacteria. Um, but if we look at them and ask where mitochondria sit, they actually sit inside this one subgroup called the alpha proteobacteria. So if you build an evolutionary tree with all organisms on the planet and include mitochondria, so now you have mitochondrial ribosome RNA genes and nuclear ribosome RNA genes from the same organism. They show up in two different parts of the tree. The nuclear genes show up with other nuclear genes as their own major lineage in the tree of life. And the mitochondrial genes show up inside the trees, inside the alpha proteobacterial branch. Not only that, but all mitochondria that you look at from across all eukaryotes, so go through all of those lineages of eukaryotes that have mitochondria, they all show up in the same point inside alpha proteobacteria. Mitochondria are a monophyletic group embedded within the alpha proteobacteria. It's very important for understanding the history of mitochondria. It's not that there have been multiple separate inventions of mitochondria. They all appear to be derived from a single event where somehow an alpha proteobacteria got inside a eukaryotic cell that eventually became the mitochondrion. If we draw this onto the full tree of life, what we end up doing is creating what you will see as the figure in, in the book or part of the figure in the book where here are mitochondria on the proteobacterial branch. And what we do is now draw a crossing branch where for some part of the tree of life, proteobacteria moved into this eukaryotic branch. And that's what's labeled here as the origin of mitochondria. So it's not a simple bifurcating tree with a node and then two descendant nodes. We now have a crossing of the trees. Yeah, question? Um, my, the presence of mitochondria is a synapomorphy for all eukaryotes. Now, I've told you before that synapomorphies are in essence, features that evolved on the branch leading up to the common ancestor of a group. To really be called synapomorphies, they should be present in most, if not all, of the members of that group. There are a few groups that are missing mitochondrion, but as we will see in a minute, that's because they lost them. So we consider that good enough to call it a synapomorphy. Does that answer your question? All right, so what are mitochondria? They are, in fact, descendants of alpha proteobacteria that somehow moved into eukaryotic cells and then became mitochondria. So we're going to do the same basic exercise now with chloroplasts. What are chloroplasts? Let's try and use the same general approach. First, let's look at them. Chloroplasts are a little more sort of complicated ultra-structurally in many ways than mitochondria. They not only have these sort of membrane sort of compartments, they also, at least many of the ones that people study, have photosynthetic apparatus that is green. Um, and you can see the sort of stacks of photosynthetic antenna inside chloroplasts. They are surrounded, I didn't mention this before, but uh, mitochondria are also surrounded by membranes. We'll see in more detail about this in a little bit. Chloroplasts have many similarities to bacteria and archaea as well. If you look inside of them, they have DNA, they have ribosomes, they have transcription and translation. 
Many of those components physically look like the components of bacteria and archaea, and again, appearance is not necessarily an indicator of common descent. Could be homology, could be convergent evolution, so we're going to look at the DNA in detail. We're going to extract that DNA, read the sequence of genes. They also have ribosomal RNA genes, as well as a variety of other genes that are shared across most organisms. We can read the sequence of those, make a data matrix, and build an evolutionary tree like with the mitochondrion. When we build an evolutionary tree for chloroplasts, it looks something like this. They group inside one branch of bacteria, one subgroup of the cyanobacteria in this case. So a separate group, not the proteobacteria this time, chloroplasts all group together into a single monophyletic group across all the different chloroplasts, across all eukaryotes. So it appears to be a single event of a cyanobacteria entering into a eukaryotic cell that gave rise to all chloroplasts. So we can draw that to complete the tree that's used in the book. Chloroplasts came from this one branch inside the cyanobacteria. We can draw another crossing branch. So for those eukaryotes, we're not showing all the eukaryotic lineages here, but for those eukaryotes that have a chloroplast, at least the original movement of a cyanobacteria into the eukaryotic cell complicates our tree even further. So organisms that have a chloroplast also generally have a mitochondrion. So now they have entities with three evolutionary histories inside of them. So again, this simple splitting model of drawing a tree of life is a bit of an oversimplification. So what are chloroplasts? They are descendants of cyanobacteria. Why should we care? Well, I, I could give this as an example for mitochondria. I'm going to talk about it for chloroplasts, but the same generally applies to mitochondria. Why does it matter which of these lineages they came from? Well, it turns out for photosynthesis, for example, this is that bigger tree of bacteria I showed you before. There are actually probably hundreds of lineages of bacteria. This is showing just 40 of them. Be thankful we didn't go through all of them. Um, there are seven or so lineages of bacteria that are photoautotrophic. If you want to understand the photoautotrophy in, say, plants or algae that are photosynthetic or any other eukaryote, it would be good to have a model system that you can work with readily that is free living and can grow easily. So you'd like to work on one of these bacteria that have photosynthesis depending on which one it came from. The fact that it came from cyanobacteria tells us that these are going to be the good model for studying the photosynthesis in plants and algae and other eukaryotes as opposed to these other lineages that are also photoautotrophic but are not going to be good model systems for plant photosynthesis. So now we're going to go one step further and ask in a little more detail for when these symbiotic events happened where a bacterium moved inside a eukaryotic cell. So we're going to start with the mitochondrion. And now we're going to do that exercise I suggested before. We're going to take a look at the eukaryotic tree. We're going to overlay onto the tree character states of presence and absence of mitochondrion, of the mitochondrion. Most eukaryotic lineages have a mitochondrion, which I've drawn in this little circle here. Here's the nucleus. But a few lineages, the diplomonids and parabasalids, do not. If we look at this data set, the sort of most parsimonious model for explaining the character states of the ancestor of eukaryotes is to infer that the common ancestor had the mitochondrion. One reason for that, again, is the evidence that all mitochondria derive from a single evolutionary event. That's shown by the phylogenetic tree where they all group together into a monophyletic group. Another piece of evidence that we're not going to talk about in detail, but it is related to something you've done in the lab, is that if you take eukaryotic cells, 
Again, you look at the nucleus in the cell and the mitochondrion in the cell. If they are derived from, if they both have been co-evolving inside eukaryotic cells since early in eukaryotic evolution, if you build a tree of the nucleus and look at how eukaryotes group together in the tree, and if you build a tree of the mitochondrion, and now don't look at how, where the mitochondrion groups relative to bacteria, but just look at how the different eukaryotes group together, those trees are congruent. The mitochondrion and the nucleus have been co-evolving with each other since the beginning of eukaryotic evolution. If there were multiple separate events of, of proteobacteria moving into eukaryotes, we would expect to see the nucleus have one phylogenetic tree and the mitochondrion to look in structure very different, maybe chimps grouping with mice or something like that if there were multiple separate events in mammals of mitochondrion originating. But that's not what we see in the nucleus, chimps group with humans, and the mitochondrion, chimps group with humans. And all the way across the tree of eukaryotes, there are those parallels. So what we infer is that there was a single event prior to the existence of the common ancestor of all the major lineages of eukaryotes. As eukaryotes diversified into those five major lineages we talked about, each of them inherited the mitochondrion into their lineage, and then all of their descendants inherited the mitochondrion too, except in one branch over here, there was the loss of the mitochondrion to give rise to those organisms that do not have mitochondria. So this is a relatively simple uh, model that is consistent with basically all the data we have on eukaryotes, the nucleus, and mitochondria. And you really want to sort of come up with a model like a single evolutionary event and then test lots of data to see how it fits with the model. And every piece of data that people look at fits with this model. It's going to get much more complicated when we look at chloroplasts, however. So if we answer this question, when did mitochondria get inside? Or when did the proteobacteria get inside to become the mitochondrion? Before the existence of the most recent common ancestor of eukaryotes. Um, so why does it matter? I'll come back to this in a little bit. But if we go back to these organisms, it turns out that even though these organisms have thrown away the mitochondrion, they have actually kept some relics of mitochondrial related functions. So the mitochondria had its own genome. That's the DNA that we looked at to build this tree. It turns out that mitochondrial genes over evolutionary time frequently move from the mitochondria into the nucleus by a process called lateral gene transfer, which we'll talk about a little more in a couple lectures. This has happened in the history of these lineages. So they have DNA in their nucleus that actually came from the mitochondrion and still carries out some functions. They're not building a whole mitochondrion, but it still carries out some functions that are related to mitochondrial functions. So knowing that these organisms had a mitochondrion in their history helps us understand them. In essence, Conceptually similar to, say, cave fish. They're blind now, but they used to see. That helps us understand the biology of those organisms. Same idea with the mitochondrion. So now let's try and apply the same principle to chloroplasts. It's not going to work nearly as well, but uh, we're going to try. So we now, again, take the tree of eukaryotes and we map onto that tree presence and absence of chloroplasts. It's much less clean. In fact, this is a gross oversimplification. There are many lineages of these major groups of eukaryotes where all of the members have chloroplasts, like this group here, the plantae. There are many other lineages where I've shown a green thing here, but there are only a few representatives of some of these lineages that have chloroplasts, like animals. Most animals don't have chloroplasts, but there are a few that in fact do. Um, some, a lot of foraminiferans do, a lot of euglenids do, but not all. So it's sort of a complex history. We can try and say what happens if we force the common ancestor 
to have chloroplasts. What does that require us to do in terms of character state reconstruction? Let's treat this as hypothesis one, that the ancestor of all eukaryotes had a chloroplast to go with its mitochondrion, and that each of the five major lineages of descent inherited that chloroplast. What this forces us to do is that all lineages that do not have chloroplasts have to have a loss event. And interestingly, in those lineages that don't have a chloroplast, we can't find relics of the chloroplast, like I told you you could find with the mitochondrion. So it doesn't look like these lineages ever had a chloroplast in their history. And it seems like this model is incorrect. There's another model that is consistent with basically all the data that we know of for chloroplasts, and it's the following that the major lineages of eukaryotes diversified without a chloroplast. They all had a mitochondrion, but they did not have a chloroplast. And then a cyanobacteria became a symbiont in the common ancestor of the plantae group. This is consistent with a lot of data that we have on the plantae group. So for example, if you take out chloroplast genes, genes from representatives of the plantae group, Imagine this common ancestor here. All descendants of this common ancestor had a nucleus, a chloroplast, and a mitochondrion. And each of them should have the same history. So if we build evolutionary trees and look at just the plant part of the tree, the chloroplast, mitochondria, and nucleus should all look the same, and in fact, they do. If we include all these other organisms here, they don't. So the chloroplast genes from Euglena do not have the same phylogeny as the nuclear genes from Euglena. The chloroplast genes from diatoms do not have the same phylogeny as nuclear genes from diatoms. So we can say basically that it appears that a symbiosis happened here and then something else has to explain the presence of chloroplasts in these other lineages. Amazingly, although when people first proposed this it seemed completely ludicrous, what appears to be the correct explanation is that these other lineages stole chloroplasts from members of the plantae group. So they basically got their chloroplasts from something in this plantae lineage. And we're going to look into that in more detail in a second. So this is a, the winning hypothesis here. So the way we're going to look into that is to think in a little more detail, not just about where on the evolutionary tree some of this occurred, but to think about how this might have occurred and really think in detail about the different genomes that are present in some of these cells. So we're going to start with this with the mitochondrion. And this is what's called the primary symbiosis in the history of mitochondria. A primary symbiosis is when, or primary endosymbiosis, if we want, really want to be technically correct, but it's generally referred to as the primary symbiosis of mitochondria. This is when some organism brings inside of it another organism. And the thing that it brought inside of it is on its own, is an isolated entity, as you will see. So the model is as follows. There was... A, what you could call a proto-eukaryotic cell. This is on the branch leading up to the common ancestor of eukaryotes, but not the most recent common ancestor of eukaryotes. So this is after the eukaryotic lineage separated from the archaeal lineage, but again, before the existence of the common ancestor of all modern eukaryotes. This lineage had a nucleus, so a membrane around the DNA. It had its own genome inside the nucleus. And it had its own cell membrane around the cytoplasm. Eukaryotes are really adept at this process of bringing things inside of them. For feeding, it's called phagocytosis. It's probably not the case that this interaction that led to the mitochondrion was for feeding. It's probably some other sort of beneficial mutualistic interaction rather than feeding, but... Um, eukaryotes have a very flexible membrane and they can bring all sorts of things inside of the cell and they do it all the time. So imagine this proto-eukaryote 
had a mutualistic beneficial interaction with some free-living alpha proteobacterium. Maybe they co-evolved for a long period of time. And then eventually, this proteobacterium got brought inside the host cell. When this initially happened, the proteobacterium, it's a proteobacteria are gram negative. It should have an outer membrane, a cell wall, and an inner membrane. I've tried to draw the whole cell envelope here, and purple are the membranes, and in between is the cell wall here. It brings this inside the cell, and it gets the host membrane around it. So now we have four envelopes, inner membrane, cell wall, outer membrane, and host membrane around it. And this was the precursor to the mitochondrion. Early in the evolution of the mitochondrion, it appears that many of these components and much of the complexity of this free-living proteobacterium were thrown away. So maybe the cell wall and one of those two membranes around the gram-negative bacterium was thrown away. Much of the genome was thrown away too, and we were left with what we would now call a mitochondrion. And that was in the most recent common ancestor of all eukaryotes. So this then gave rise to the five major lineages of eukaryotes. So now we're going to consider what's called the primary symbiosis in the history of chloroplasts. So again, we think that this happened in the plantae lineage after the diversification of the five major lineages of eukaryotes, but before the diversification within the plantae. So there was some primitive, well, primitive, bad word. I always criticize other people for saying that, but some ancestor of the plantae lineage that looked like this with a nucleus, with the nuclear genome, a mitochondrion with the mitochondrial genome. It had some sort of mutualistic interaction with a free-living cyanobacterium. Cyanobacteria are also gram-negative, so it should have around it an outer membrane, a cell wall, and an inner membrane. It brought that inside of the cell. Originally, that would look like this with the host membrane, the outer bacterial membrane, the cell wall, and the inner bacterial membrane. And as with the mitochondrion, eventually many of these parts got thrown away, as did much of the genome, although less got thrown away than as we see for the mitochondrion. But that became the chloroplast. So maybe some of the components, some of the cell membranes got tossed and some of the genome got tossed, but not quite all of it. And that's the common ancestor of the chloroplast. And then we had the diversification within the plantae lineage to give rise to all of the different lineages that have a primary chloroplast symbiont. Again, this is called a primary symbiosis in the history of chloroplasts because something brought inside of it an entity that was on its own. The cyanobacteria was just alone and was brought inside, and that's called a primary symbiosis. So if you think about this, or think about any of these models, what you should be thinking about is what should evolutionary trees of these different compartments look like? Again, I've sort of talked about this, but, and I've already shown some data for this, but for example, the, the chloroplast tree, right? It's gonna look like this with plastids inside cyanobacteria. There's some detail in here that we will come back to in a few minutes for the exact structure within the chloroplast branch of the tree here. A key feature that helps support the model that chloroplasts are derived from cyanobacteria is the presence of peptidoglycan in the chloroplasts and glaucophytes. So it appears that in this glaucophyte branch, what probably happened is the symbiosis happened here in the lineage leading up to the common ancestor, and then these lineages separated. At that time, the chloroplast still had a cell wall around it. In this lineage, in glaucophytes, 
they kept the cell wall. And in this lineage over here, the cell wall was lost. So the chloroplasts in red algae and chlorophytes and plants and caraphytes do not have a cell wall, but glaucophytes do. So what's amazing again is this acquisition of chloroplasts in other eukaryotes where they got it from plantae, from members of this plant group. The model is as follows. You had a normal eukaryote. By normal, I mean presence. It had a nucleus and a mitochondrion. This must have occurred sometime after the plantae lineage acquired chloroplasts. There was an interaction between this eukaryote and this probably single-celled member of the plantae group. It brought that inside of it. It now is surrounded by its own membrane and the host membrane. So now we have the original nucleus, the original mitochondrion, the new nucleus from the symbiont, the new mitochondrion, and the target probably of this, the chloroplast. This is probably driven largely by selection for acquiring photosynthesis. That's probably what's driving this, acquiring this cell and bringing it inside. Chloroplasts have a very important function that's very rare across the diversity of life. So they bring this inside and in fact, what appears to have happened is simplification like with the mitochondrion and the chloroplast. But some form of this arrangement is what we think, is what we see inside those organisms that have chloroplasts but are not in the plantae lineage. Again, Many of them have thrown away the symbionts mitochondrion. They don't need two mitochondria. Mitochondria across eukaryotes generally have basically the same function. Many of them have thrown away the second nucleus, although not all of them. There are many eukaryotes that have both their regular nucleus and what's called usually a nucleomorph, which is the nucleus of their symbiont. And all of the ones we're talking about here have kept the chloroplast. That's why we're looking at them. There may be other cases of symbioses, but we don't see them because we're following the chloroplast here. So now you have to think about if this model were correct, what would the phylogeny of the different genomes look like? There are now five genomes here to consider. So the nucleus should look like the phylogeny of just whatever eukaryotic lineage brought in this symbiont. That's this nucleus here. If you have a relic of the symbiont's nucleus, it should group in evolutionary trees with plantae. The chloroplast should group in evolutionary trees with whichever branch in the plantae was brought inside. Whatever lineage of plantae was brought in as a symbiont, that should be seen in this chloroplast. So there are five lineages of plantae. Which one of them were brought inside? We can, if there is a nucleus left over of the symbiont, we can look at it. Usually that's gone. So we have to look at the phylogeny of the chloroplast. Um, sometimes you can tell this by structural features. These different groups appear pretty different in many ways. But usually what you have to do is extract the DNA, build an evolutionary tree, and see where the chloroplast groups in evolutionary trees. Does it group with chloroplasts of red algae, or of glaucophytes, or of chlorophytes? So let's do this for one of the cases where we think there has been a secondary symbiosis. Euglenas, if you look at euglenas, you can see inside of them their chloroplast is surrounded by more membranes than you would expect if there was just a primary symbiosis. Sorry, I, I'm going to go back for one second here. Um, this is called a secondary symbiosis because what's being brought inside is an organism that already has symbionts inside that is able to propel the colonies from various red algae. So the symbiont inside, the, what's being brought inside, it's now that that symbiont's second symbiosis. That's why it's called secondary symbiosis. Okay, so here's the euglena. 
Let's pull apart the genomes inside the euglena. The nuclear genome shows that euglenas are members of this excavate lineage. So they're not inside the plantae lineage and they're surrounded mostly by organisms that don't have photosynthesis. This if we look at the chloroplast of euglenas, it groups in this plastid tree with the chloroplast of the chlorophytes. So what we have to propose is basically that there was some sad, non-photosynthetic, lonely excavate out there. It engaged in some positive interaction with a chlorophyte and brought that chlorophyte inside of it to produce what we now observe with euglenas. Again, the mitochondrial genome got thrown away. Um, much of the nuclear genome, if not all of it, got thrown away, but the chloroplast got kept. When we draw this on an evolutionary tree, we have to add another branch here, like we did for chloroplasts and mitochondria. Now we have a eukaryote going into another eukaryote branch with a secondary symbiosis. Let's do it again, now with another lineage that has a secondary symbiosis. These are the diatoms. Diatoms have a lot of diversity. These are actually fossil diatoms, so we're not going to, uh, unless they're very recent fossils, uh, study the, extract the DNA out of the chloroplast there, but we can get modern living diatoms, which again have complicated membrane structures around their chloroplasts. If we do the nuclear DNA from diatoms, it shows up as them grouping as sister taxa to the brown algae in the chrome alveolates, the stromenopyle subgroup within the chrome alveolates. The chloroplast, however, groups with the red algae. So here's the euglena grouping inside the green algae, the chlorophytes. Uh, the diatoms group inside the red algae. So the model here is that there was a stromenopyle wanting photosynthesis engaged in some type of mutualistic interaction with a red algal cell, brought that inside, and that's what was the common ancestor of the diatoms. Again, parts of it, the symbiont may have been thrown away, but this is, the, in essence, the origin of many of the diatoms that are out there. We have to draw it now again with another branch in the tree with a eukaryote, bringing in a eukaryote. This this sequence shows it turns out there are many other secondary symbioses in eukaryotic evolution. We have to start drawing lots and lots of lines of eukaryotes bringing in other eukaryotes. It appears to have happened in dinoflagellates, amoebozoans, and in the ancestor probably of apicomplexans. One of the interesting things about apicomplexans is that they are not photosynthetic. They do not have a green chloroplast. They do have what's called an apicoplast. People have seen this organelle inside members of the apicomplexans. Remember, the apicomplexans include the causative agent of malaria, plasmodium falciparum. They have this apicoplast that for many years people thought was related to mitochondria. When they finally got DNA out of the apicoplast and built evolutionary trees of it, it shows that it is clearly a secondary derived chloroplast as opposed to a mitochondrion. This lineage appears to have thrown away the photosynthesis on top of throwing away many of the other compartments of the eukaryote that it brought inside. But it has still retained some of the ancestral cyanobacterial functions in the apicoplast. That's important to know because it turns out if you want to treat malarial infections, I don't know if you know, but malaria evolves resistance to many of the drugs that are used to treat it, like all organisms out there when we treat them with a variety of drugs. There are many people that are working on strategies to target the apicoplast for drugs. That's a good target because if you target just the core functions of plasmodium, the nucleus, 
Well, in case you don't know, were eukaryotes also? Some of the drugs that target the nuclear functions in plasmodium can make us a little bit sick because they're targeting things that we have. We don't have a chloroplast or anything derived from a chloroplast. So if you target functions that are derived from the cyanobacterium in this apicoplast, they may be unique and not make the animal host of plasmodium as sick as general eukaryote targeting drugs. There are actually multiple people here on campus that are working at the, uh, on this type of strategy for treating malaria. So, sort of mind-blowing, but we're going to go through this. It appears that there are some lineages of eukaryotes that have an even more complex history for their chloroplasts. And it looks like what they did was there was another lonely eukaryotic cell and, and it brought inside of it one of these cells that had a secondary symbiosis, like a diatom or a euglena, and a brings it inside, and now you have the tertiary symbiosis. This is the third symbiosis in the history of this chloroplast. So now if this organism kept all of its different genomes, which they rarely do, but if it did, you would have the host nuclear genome, the secondary symbionts nuclear genome, and the first symbionts nuclear genome. So three different nuclei with different histories, three different mitochondrion with different histories, and one chloroplast. An utter mess, basically. But this appears to have happened in history at least a few times. Again, we can trace the evolutionary history of each of these compartments by building evolutionary trees of the DNA that's left over. So for example, one of the dinoflagellates that has photosynthesis appears to have done this. If you look at the, the chloroplasts, for example, they're basically surrounded by so many membranes that you can barely imagine how stuff gets in and out. And it appears that there may have been a tertiary symbiosis in history here for this dinoflagellate group and for an animal group that has photosynthesis. So there are sea slugs that appear to have brought organisms that had a secondary symbiosis inside of them to create a tertiary symbiosis, photosynthetic animals. In the history of sort of chloroplast evolution, it's quite complicated, much more complex than mitochondrial evolution. So I'm going to go to this in one second. Are there any, I know it's late and people's heads hurt, but are there any questions about um, the primary, secondary, and tertiary symbiosis before we get to the next thing? Yeah. Does that mean it might equal slug that's like quaternary? Uh, if he eats the slugs, so that's a quaternary symbiosis. Um, we really only consider this for stable interaction, so I don't think you're going to become photosynthetic if you eat the slug. Yeah, sure. It's in your aquatic basically. Yeah. How does it get rid of the mitochondrial DNA without getting rid of the membrane? So, you mean when they lose the mitochondria? So, many of them, um, there's probably very strong selection to maintain the core class. And, like with everything in evolution, sometimes something goes wrong. You get mutations that lose features. If that feature is not useful, like the mitochondria may not be useful, they'll just, the, that cell will do just as well or even better than the cell with the mitochondria and eventually it gets lost. Why do we retain all the membranes around the chloroplast? Well, it turns out that evolution is not about perfecting things. So our history, the history of these cells, affects the phenotype, right? So the fact that these, all these membranes were there, the cell managed to figure out how to transport molecules through all of those membranes. It actually is probably harder to get rid of them than to keep them, even though it's very costly to have you know, six membranes around this compartment. It's a historical contingency like the appendix and like lots of other things. Yeah? Uh, I have a question from this lecture. Are we supposed to get, like, what are we supposed to get from this lecture? Is that supposed to be the name of what happened or just a mechanism? You should understand everything I talked about. 
You should understand what endosymbioses are, what a primary symbiosis is, how to tease apart the different evolutionary histories of different genomes inside a cell. If I showed you a tree with the evolutionary history of a chloroplast, you should tell me what lineage that chloroplast came from. I'm not going to label it like the tree I showed up here, but it would be labeled with, you know, chlorophytes and glycophytes, lineages that you're supposed to learn. You should be able to integrate with what we're talking about here, which is symbioses and studying evolutionary history of organisms. Um, any other question or yeah? What happened to the mitochondria and the nucleus? So in many cases, they just disappear. Well, they don't really get kicked out. I mean, you can imagine the cell is reproducing. Some of the offspring cell get, don't get the nucleus, and that cell does fine. It might even do better. And those are the ones that get transmit. Those are the ones that we see now. These are very old symbioses. So we're only seeing the end result of, you know, hundreds of millions of years of evolution. We're not seeing the, the origin of these symbioses. OK, so to help you think about this, one way to do this is to think about all the different genes inside these organisms sort of co-evolving with the species or not co-evolving with the species. And the way we do this is we draw what are called gene trees inside species trees, in essence. So imagine these big, black, thick lines. Ignore the yellow and blue for a minute. These big, black, thick lines are the backbone evolution of, say, a whole cell or species here with the normal tree of life, the rooted tree of life with archaea over here, sharing a common ancestor with each other, eukaryotes here, sharing a common ancestor with each other, and then jointly archaea and eukaryotes being sister taxa, and then bacteria over here. Now imagine for normal genes inside these organisms, if you pulled out any individual gene from any of these organisms, those genes evolve in the same way as the species. So if we pulled out any of these individual genes in here, I've drawn these gene trees that are perfectly tracking the big black species trees. So if we pull those out and we build an evolutionary tree, it's going to look like this, with just the gene tree with, our, again, archaea grouping together, eukaryotes, and bacteria. They're all going to look the same if everything is simple in evolutionary history. But not everything is simple. Imagine if there was a symbiosis where a bacteria was brought inside of this cell, like the cyanobacteria being brought inside some eukaryotes. So it's only in one of the branches of eukaryotes that one bacterium gets brought inside. And now if we look at the DNA inside of this cell, it might be in different compartments like a chloroplast or a nucleus. Let's just ignore that for now. We look at the DNA inside this cell. Some of it, the DNA that came from the nucleus, will track perfectly the same way the species did before. It'll look just like this, right? With all the eukaryotes together, all the archaea together, all the bacteria together. While but the genes that came from the symbiont will look the really weird. Organisms on the They're planet. inside Specifically, the these eukaryotes. Of the marine but the forest. genes group in evolutionary trees with bacteria. That's what we see with chloroplast genes, for example. I put mitochondria here, but it should be chloroplast. So right, that's what we see. In some plants, there are nuclear genes that look like this, While these are protists, grouping with other eukaryotes, they form some of the and there are chloroplast are genes protists, that group like this, they form some of the grouping with bacteria. On the planet. You have to imagine the giant many separate the gene forest. trees inside these species trees in order to sort of understand how people have deconvoluted these primary, secondary, and tertiary symbiotic events. And I'll just uh, leave it at there.